Thank you, Evan. Okay, so just a few reminders before we get started. Just a reminder that you are being recorded and by participating in the meeting, you are giving consent to be recorded. Also a reminder to say your name before you speak. And then a reminder that it is a roll call vote for every vote on the agenda. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Candy. All righty, thank you. Um, you have the agenda that's mailed out to you for um, the meeting and we need to call the meeting to order. Um, can we have a roll call? Candace Clevenger. Here. Paige Tote. Okay. Vivian Goodman. Here. Jan Hack. Here. Dr. Jerger. Here. Sue Crows. Here. Mary Jane Linton. Here. Dr. Meningotti. Dr. Patterson. Phil Tibbs. Laura Zimmerman. Here. Um, thank you. Brandy, you want to introduce our new board member? Yes, very happy to introduce Sue Crows, who we all had discussed a couple of months ago. And Sue has volunteered, and we're very happy about that, and has been approved. So um, welcome to Sue, and thank you, Sue, for volunteering. We are very happy to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, I need approval of the agenda topics. You have the agenda in front of you. Candy, I would actually, um, there's been some information we've gotten today that I would like to, if the board approves, add a discussion regarding Popeyes in old business. Okay, um, is there, everybody approve the agenda with adding Popeyes to old business? I have a motion to approve? Brett, approve. Thank you, Brett. Second. Laura, second. Oh. Thank you. Oops. Um, all in, uh, roll call vote, please. Candace Clevenger. Yes. Vivian Goodman. Yes. Jan Hack. Yes. Dr. Jurger. Yes. Sue Crows. Yes. Mary Jane Linton. Yes. And Laura Zimmerman. Yes. Thank you. Um, is there any public comment? There is no public here, and we did not receive any public comment via email. Thanks, Randy. All right, the next item is approval of the previous minutes, uh, meeting minutes. You received them in your packet. Do you have any additions or changes to the minutes? No. Okay, um, can I move for approval? I move. Who's that? Second. Mary Jane. Mary Jane. Thank you. Jane, second. second. Thank you. Dan. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, roll call vote. Candace Clevenger. Approved. Vivian Goodman. Approved. Jan Hack. Approved. Dr. Jerger. Approved. Sue Crows. Approved. Mary Jane Linton. Approved. And Laura Zimmerman. Approved. Thank you. Um, any communication, Brandy? I'm just going to give a brief update regarding COVID-19 response. So um, things continue to be rolling along here. We're doing everything that we can response wise with contact tracing. We have been very grateful to find some really great candidates that we've been able to bring on board to assist with those efforts. We also, as I believe I highlighted last month, have really grown our number of trained staff throughout all of the divisions in the health department. So we've got a very large team that is able to and has jumped in and assist with contact calls um, throughout this response. So very, very grateful for that. And of course, for the nursing team that continues to move on every single day of the week and making sure that those cases and contacts are called. Um, but we're all, I think, very excited that we've gotten more people on the team. Um, we've done some of the restructuring that we've talked to you all about 
about in regard to our administration division and then also clinical nursing services. So some of those positions have started or will be starting next week. We still have a lot of job openings that we need to fill. So um, certainly if you can help spread the word, it's not only nurse positions, there are a lot of other types of positions specific to COVID and even some outside of COVID. So if you know anyone, uh, certainly refer them to our website in the career section, those, po those positions are listed. We also continue in every division to do everything that we can to continue to provide those essential services. Uh, we're very grateful that we've been able to make some adaptations in each division to still serve our clients and patients. We've gotten some really great curbside signs outside so that people can be served even easier with our curbside services that we've adopted during this time in the front and in the back of the building. And, um, you know, we have a lot on the agenda to go through in a lot of detail today. So you're going to hear a lot about the different divisions and we'll go into a lot more detail during the budget. But as I always like to do, um, just very grateful for the team that's been here because they're amazing and um, they just keep on going. And I know everybody's doing that at every um, business right now in different ways, but um, they're certainly an amazing public health team. So very grateful for them. That's all I have today as far as uh, COVID-19 update date. All right, thank you, Brandy. Um, financial report, Sheree. Okay, the financial report was in your packet and it is through the end of August. So we were 75% into our fiscal year. Um, accounts receivable was 710,000 and deferred revenue was 653,000. And our ending fund balance as of the end of August was just under 5 million. Then on the next page, total revenue was at 4,612,000, which is 55.2% into our budgeted revenue for the year. And total expenditures was at 4,390,000, which is 53% into our budgeted expenditures for the, for the year. Sheree, um, are we so low on the revenue and the expenditures, uh, expenditures as a percent of the budget because of the COVID and not spending all the money? Yes. Will that roll over to next year if you don't spend it all in this particular time period? Yeah, I will have to do a resolution <laughs> to move it. <laughs> I tried to guess what we would spend in this fiscal year and what we would spend in next year, so I'm sure it will require an adjustment. But yeah, the um, the contact tracing grant does not end until the end of May, so we'll have some time in the next fiscal year too. All right, thank you. Is that it for the financial report? Yes. Any other questions? I need a motion to accept the financial report. Laura, so moved. Thank you. A second. Vivian second. Thank you, Vivian. Um, roll call vote, please. Candace Clevenger. Approved. Vivian Goodman. Approved. Jan Hack. <coughs> Approved. Approved. Dr. Jurger. Approved. Sue Crows. Approved. Mary Jane Linton. Mayor Jane. I muted. I'm sorry. Approved. <laughs> and Laura Zimmerman. Approved. Guys, I'm sorry. This is Paige. I joined late. I approve still. Thanks, Paige. Yep. All right. Thank you. Motion carries. Um, we also have in your packet the um, bills that were paid. I need a motion to approve the payment of the um, bills. Mary Jane. Jane, thank you. A second. I'll second. It's Janet Patterson. Okay. I'm here finally. Thank you, Janet. Um, roll call vote, please. Candace Clevenger. Approved. Paige Toth. Approved. 
Vivian Goodman. Approve. Jana Ack. Approve. Dr. Jerger. Approve. Crows. Approve. Mary Jane Linton. Approve. Janet Patterson. Approve. Laura Zimmerman. Approve. Thank, thank you. Motion passed. The next um, item is um, grant applications for review. Are there any? No. no thank you. Um, in your packet were department um, division reports. Does anybody have any questions for any of the staff? No. Staff want to highlight anything? Um, I would like to um, just step in and make you all aware of something. Um, Carol Carlton, our Director of Clinical Nursing Services, um, whom has been here for a very long time. I don't know off the top of my head exactly how many years, but I know I've been here with her for at least, um, you know, 13 of my years here. So um, Carol has dedicated a lot of her career to the health department and working a different division. She's been our director of clinical nursing for a while. Um, she's been phenomenal in her role. We're incredibly grateful for her. She's amazing to work with. Um, but she is going to retire effective on December 4th. We are extremely happy for Carol. She will be missed um, very, very much, but we're very happy for her. So extremely grateful. Um, can't really put into words how thankful that we are for everything that she has done here. She never ceases to step up when something is needed, even in this pandemic. Um, she's always there when you need her. Um, and we're so grateful for everything that she has given, but we are very happy for her that she is going to be able to retire. And so um, we are looking for a director of clinical nursing. That position has been posted, but I wanted to make you all aware as, you know, Carol is on these calls every month. She's a member of our leadership team. And um, I just wanted to publicly thank Carol for everything that she's done um, for all of us here at the health department and for the community. She never doesn't answer the phone and never isn't there for someone, whether it's someone in our building or outside of our building. So um, I know that she's going to have everything prepared as, you know, for the next person to be successful. But of course, we will all miss her very much. Thank you, Brandy. And thank you, Carol, for uh, all your years of service. I know you've been a big yes. help. I know you were help for, for oh, yes. us at times. So thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Candy. It'll be sad to go. I, I don't want to think about it right now, but I just, I, it's time for me. I'm not running because of COVID, but uh, other issues too. But um, it is a, it's been a big job. Uh, the COVID has been a really big job. So, um, but I appreciate all the support you guys have given uh, me through the years in my different roles. So thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. I've enjoyed working with you. Congratulations, Carol. <laughs> Thanks, Mary Jane. Mm -hmm. All right, we have the um, recognition of the employees. Karen Shifflett, 26 years. Deborah Martin, 23 years. Dr. Uh, I can't remember how to say it. It's Aga. That's okay. Yasanaga. Yasanaga, thank you. Nine years. Kenna Harmon, seven years. Jacqueline Irvin, seven years. Melissa Woodward, six years. Kayla Horton, five years. Sandy, three years. Emily Grandstaff, one year. Thank you for your, thank you for your service. Um, old business. Um, okay. So, sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. Um, the Board of Health member update, of course, I highlighted that at the beginning, but um, at the last county board member, Sue Crows was approved by the county board to become a board of health member. So very excited to have her on board. And now we do have a full board, which is excellent. We will have some terms ending in May, which we will start talking about a little bit next month and the month following. So um, those of you whose term is ending, start thinking about if you'd be interested in staying on with us or if you have any recommendations for someone that you um, think would be a great addition to our board, certainly you can let me know or you can let Candy know and we can talk through that. But again, very happy to have Sue and all of the experience that she brings to the table. I did meet with Sue yesterday and we went over some of the larger projects that we're working on. Um, so hopefully she can feel as prepared as possible, but I did let her know if she has any questions to certainly ask um, as we move forward together as a full board now. And that's all I have for that. And the, any questions from anyone on that bullet point? Thank you again. No. 
All right, and the next thing, discussion regarding Popeyes. We just wanted to make you all aware, we had been getting uh, some communication from the Popeyes you know, owners, management that's out of state, not the people that we met here, but they are interested in applying for a new license. And we were told to forward them to legal. So we did forward them to the state's attorney's office. And we did get some communication back from the state's attorney's office today, which is why we're adding this. Just to let you all know that this communication has come to us. There's not something in the ordinance that specifically speaks to if someone's permit is revoked, if they are able to apply for a new one, and if they are or not, what the stipulations would have to be. So this is something that the board would have to decide. We cannot vote on this tonight because it wasn't on our agenda. We can certainly discuss it if you all would like to discuss that. And if you would like to bring it to a board vote, we can do that next month or whenever it seems appropriate to the board to bring that up for a vote. But Basically, I would just like to let you know that. And then if we want to open it for discussion, Kathy, our Director of Environmental Health and Emergency Preparedness, she is on the meeting as well. So if you have specific questions for her, she is here to answer those. But I'd just like to open that for discussion to see if you all would like to put this on um, the agenda at any point to make a decision to then get back to Popeyes. Do y'all have a feeling for what you want to do? Well, I think, Kathy, do you want to speak a little bit about what we talked about on the phone uh, in regard to this request? Sure. Hi, everybody. This is Kathy. Um, one of the things that Brandy and I discussed is that previously with Popeyes, we had already issued the letter stating that if any of these, you know, certain scenarios happened again, that the permit was going to be revoked. Um, those happened again. That's why we had the hearing and it was revoked. So this time, you know, we can still do something similar to that. Um, for lack of better words, we could put um, into play like a corrective action plan that they have to do certain requirements weekly, monthly. Um, you know, if we see certain items on inspections, increase their inspections. There's lots of ideas that we could potentially do. Um, and if that's something that you guys would like for me to put together, um, just to kind of see what we could do um, or some of the ideas that I have, I can definitely do that and have that ready for you guys to go next month. So you guys can look at it that way. Um, but the, the biggest thing that um, that I told Brandy that concerns me is, remember, we're, you know, this is the first time this has ever happened in Macon County. So whatever we decide to do today is setting the path of how we're going to handle things coming through if it ever gets to the situation again. Um, and I would also like to, in this corrective action plan, for lack of better words, call it, you know, basically state that if we go this route, and offer them this opportunity that if it doesn't work like what it hasn't worked in the past, that that's it. There, there's no more chances. Um, and that, again, so I can create something if that's um, something that you guys as board members are interested in seeing. I would like to see that uh, because the concern is that if someone's warned time and time again, and do the same things, they're not compliant with what they're asked to do, uh, you know, that's really problematic. And I, you know, if we do, I think it has to be very stringent in terms of, you know, the next strike, you're, don't ask again. But you know, how many people get sick over that extra try? I don't know. I mean, I don't know the answer to that. We don't have experience with it, right? With allowing somebody to come back who, who's been in that position before. That's correct. And, you know, one thing that I told Brandy is I'm, you know, I'm always pro business, but I'm also pro community health. And in right. this situation, it's a very fine line that can go either way, you mm -hmm. know, in, in just an instant. And the fact that, you know, the, they kind of at the meeting overlooked it like, oh, well, you know, I'm new and I'm going to do differently. Well, you know, how many people have to get sick? To, I don't know. I mean, I don't know the answer, but I'm I'm pro business, but I'm more pro health. I don't know. I mean, what do some other people think? That I was just wondering too. Maybe 
maybe, you know, since this is the first time in Macon County, what do like McLean County or some of the surrounding counties, maybe they've, have they had this situation before? Because my concern is the same, you know, the same thing that Mary Jane said, that they um, were able to do this over and over again. And it, and it seemed like to me they were just, you know, they were filling out those things and just lying about the temperatures. And then they said those were the same people that were going to be in charge and fix it. And so I just feel like that's kind of, I don't know how we deal with that, but that's just my biggest concern. Yes. And, and I would agree with that. My biggest concern is what's the precedent from other areas on that one. So I, I don't think we need to be a trailblazers on that one. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I will definitely, I'll put um, some type of like I said, corrective action plan together for you guys to review. I'll also reach out to the other um, counties in Region 6, the EH directors, and see if they've ever been down this path, how they've handled it, um, and just see if I can get some more information from those counties in our same region. And I'll get all of that and present it to you guys next month. That sounds good. And this is Brandy. The state's attorney's office did send us some information, too, about how the city does it and how the liquor commission does it so we can include that as well so that you can see the local comparison too okay all right thank you i think that'll be helpful okay any other questions or comments with that okay so Have we're we done to do business from them? i'm sorry what do we have a proposal from the company as to what they would look do you or guarantee again at this point or no? At this point, no. We just, um, the email that was received basically is just them trying to rebrand Popeyes. Sure. Um, and they did make a comment about, you know, doing some, uh, like a big grand opening, you know, saying how they've worked with the health department and they're going to meet health department guidelines and that kind of stuff. Other than that, um, what they gave us in the hearing was about all we have when it comes to their corrective actions. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. All right, thank you. Um, new business. Okay, so the first thing we have um, is discussion regarding Kentucky Fried Chicken closure and next steps. That's something just to discuss and make you all aware of, just in case anything comes forward from that. And Kathy is also going to speak on that situation for us. Okay, guys, bear with me. I'm going to try and share something. Unknown participant is now joining. Can you guys see the PowerPoint? No. Hold on. Now, can you see yes. it? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, Evan, our IT guy, said it would be easier for me to show um, the PowerPoint presentation because that's built into Teams. So, hopefully, this is going to work okay. Interrupt me at any time here. So, I just want to give you a quick update on Kentucky Fried Chicken here in Decatur. Um, last February 1st, we did an opening inspection for a change of ownership. We found some um, violations that needed to be corrected. We said we would return on February 4th and again in 30 days. Um, we did a reinspection on February 5th. Those violations that needed to be corrected were not done. We did a reinspection on February 6th. Those violations were finally corrected. Um, when we went back to do the 30 day reinspection, um, none of those items were corrected. So at that time, we suspended their permit. Um, we did receive a letter from Mr. Salvador Elias, who's the director with EYM Foods, stating that everything was going to be fixed by the end of business day, March 4th. Here's a copy of his letter, um, you know, just addressing all of that. You can see that he is even asking for a reinspection um, scheduled for tomorrow, March 5th in the morning so that they could open the restaurant back up for lunch. Um, on, or I'm sorry, March 5th, not February 5th, I apologize. So on March 5th, we went there. Um, violations were not corrected. Facility was to remain closed. We went back on the 6th. Violations were corrected, and we reopened the facility. Um, on March, or I'm sorry, June 10th, um, we did a routine inspection. Things were okay. Unknown participant is now exiting. 
on routine inspection and a complaint investigation on October 16th. The complaint was that they were serving raw chicken and that complaint was actually founded. Um, one thing to note is on October 16th, um, they just, the inspector noted that the drain in the prep area was clogged and that floor tiles were damaged. Um, fast forward to this year, March 2nd of 2020, um, we did a routine inspection. Again, it was observed that there was a drain in the pipe or the prep area that was closed. Floor tiles were missing and damaged. Um, we did a complaint investigation on the very first day of our quarantine, March 17th, regarding, regarding a large bird's nest that was actually in the canopy over the drive through window. Um, the complaint said that with it being up there, um, there was a lot of um, bird feces all over the drive through ledge and down the, um, the outside of the building. It was founded. Um, we received another complaint on March 31st regarding the exact same thing. They did not fix it between the 17th and the 31st. Um, we received another complaint on the exact same thing on April 7th. Um, this time, the manager got out and fixed the salute or fixed the problem himself. So it was fixed that day. We did a routine inspection on June 24th, 2020, and a complaint in inspection, I apologize. Again, the complaint was founded and the facility was closed. Some of the observations made during this investigation was a severe infestation of flies, um, cross-contamination, standing water due to the backup of the three-compartment sink, missing floor tiles, and excessive grease. Here are just a few pictures to show you. When the inspector first walked in, you were looking at underneath the three compartment sink. Um, that is their drain. At the time he walked in, the water was right there at the rim of the drain. Um, by the later on in the inspection, it had actually overflowed and was completely um, coming out onto the floor throughout the prep area and the kitchen area. Keep in mind, this is this is gray water. This is dirty water that's coming up. Um, here's a drain. Um, again, that you can see with standing water that is backed up. Another drain um, that obviously has had some, some damage to it, hence why all of the floor tiles around it are gone. When we walked in, they were actually trying to plunge the drains themselves to try and help get the backup. Um, this is their mop sink. So besides being soiled, again, you can see backup in there. Uh, pictures of just the missing floor tiles throughout the entire facility. This is actually right outside their walk-in cooler. It is their um, HVAC return system. And if if I wish we could have had a better picture, but that inside of it, the fan and the blower is 100% covered in mold. Um, again, the picture on the right, that's actually out in the dining room and that door that you see on the left goes into the kitchen. The backup was so bad that it was actually coming out into the dining room. This was um, their storage room um, at the time of the backup. They hurried up and basically threw everything in here because it was the higher ground to try and keep everything dry. This is just showing the, the accumulation of grease buildup and, and debris that needed to be cleaned. So we received um, for that closing on June 24th, we received a corrective action plan by the district manager, John Harris. He showed us um, receipts and work done by um, Kelly's for the grease trap. Rotor rooter came out, jetted the drains, Guardian Pest came out and sprayed. Um, they asked for a reinspection on the 26th. We went out there. Not all the violations were corrected. Um, we went back out on the 29th, and finally, the facility was allowed to reopen with the stipulation that we gave them an additional 30 days to replace the floor tiles. Um, they explained to us that by the time they got floor tiles, they hired the contractors to come in, you know, a few other things. So we decided to work with them, give them an additional 30 days for those floor tiles. That 30 days was up July 24th. So we went out to do a reinspection and the floor tiles were not fixed. The second inspection um, for those that 30 day to those floor tiles, this time we said we're done, we're only giving you seven days. Um, and we went back out on the 31st of July and they were all repaired. 
On the 24th of August, we received another complaint talking about the garbage overflowing at the dumpster, um, large fly presence, and the, that was founded. The other part of the complaint, I believe, was standing water, which at the time was not there, so that was unfounded. Um, so on August 24th, we said that we would be back in 30 days to see the garbage. These are pictures from that meet or that inspection. So you can see already that they already have quite a bit of garbage on the outside built up, ready for somebody to come get their garbage. Just more pictures showing that. Um, we then got an additional complaint on September 10th regarding that the garbage was there um, and also stating that there was um, an issue with the chicken. So the garbage complaint was founded. The chicken complaint was unfounded. So I'm just going to show you that we did close the facility, but I'm going to show you pictures as to why. This is their only hand sink in their prep area. It is completely backed up and it is unusable. So they were not able to wash their hands out of the sink in the prep area. This is their mop sink, um, completely backed up. Um, we found items like this. This is chicken pot pie. This is now where you're getting into the garbage on the inside. All of these boxes that you're gonna see are filled with garbage. Um, everywhere, filled with garbage. Um, this particular photo has mac and cheese in it, it has corn in it, it has mashed potatoes in it. So you can also imagine the large number of flies and what this is, you know, this could harbor and a huge pest invasion here. Um, again, this is the inside, all garbage. Um, the inside again, more garbage, more garbage. Um, the outside dumpster, you can see that there's still even garbage out here. Um, so due to the imminent health hazard, they were closed immediately on September 10th. Um, and now, hey, am I still sharing? Yes. Is it off now? Yeah. No. Yes. Yes, it is off. Yes. Okay. okay. Off. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So <laughs> why we're um, bringing this to your attention is that um, this this particular closure was their second closure in a 12 month period. Remember we closed them June 24th and then we closed them again on uh, September 10th. Um, so we're just bringing this to your attention because it may um, come to where we need to have a hearing with them and, and get your guys's intake on this also. Are there any questions for me? Good job. Thank you very much, Kathy. And just so you all know, this is not something we're asking, of course, for any kind of vote or decision. We just wanted to make sure that you were informed about the direction that this may be heading so that you had um, a heads up about that. And that's, I, that's all we have right now. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. You got a discussion regarding COVID-19 enforcement? Okay, so as we have been discussing each month since March, there is an enforcement piece, of course, to if people are not compliant, whether that's businesses um, enforcing masks or whatever else that has been with capacity limits, et cetera, throughout the duration of this local response. Throughout this time, we have worked very, very closely with the state's attorney's office. We've worked with IDPH. We've worked with local law enforcement. We've worked with Illinois State Police. A lot of times there's only so much that we've been able to do and we've done that to ensure that we're doing our due diligence. We do have a three step process that Kathy has managed throughout this time period where if we do get a complaint, there's an educational call. Second complaint, there is a visit. We're providing education at that visit as well. Um, third complaint, if it is a business over which we have jurisdiction, they may be served a cease and desist order um, because they are not being compliant. And all of that is um, steps that we have checked through with legal to ensure that we are doing what we are allowed to do and should be doing in those situations. If it's a business over which we did not have jurisdiction, we would still do the steps other than a cease and desist because we did not have jurisdiction over that business. Of course, with the administrative rule in regard to enforcement of masks, it does give a lot more power to local boards of health, 
health departments, et cetera. So we had been asked by the city when they adopted their ordinance to assist with investigating the complaints that they receive. We basically told them we were consulting with legal and we get back to them on that. We also, um, like I said, did consult with legal to see what we should or could be doing with this because we want to make sure we are not going outside the parameter of what we should be doing, but want to make sure we're doing our due diligence. So um, we're continuing to follow those steps. I did get some follow-up from the state's attorney's office. And basically what they said is at this point, it's a policy decision for the administrator. And then of course, to discuss with the board as far as how we want to proceed in uh, these violations and how we want to address them. Um, Kathy, Bethany and I have talked about this in great detail because for example, if you get a complaint about a large you know, grocery store or something where they may be doing everything within their power to enforce people wearing masks, but then once the people come in, if they take them off, um, that may not be an appropriate situation to, full, to pull a, a food permit or issue a cease and desist order in that situation. But if it's a place that's outright being non-compliant on purpose, um, they're putting people's lives at risk by you know, not following any of these rules, that might be a somewhat different situation. So in trying to determine how we should move forward, we wanted to discuss with the board what your thoughts were um, as far as how much more stringent you would like to go. Different health departments and counties are doing this differently. Different law enforcement in different counties are doing this differently. One thing Kathy did do just to prepare us, depending on what you all thought and said, well, she did go ahead and draft um, a mask ordinance that was mirrored from other health departments that do have one of those of their own. Our city has one, of course. And so we do have that in draft form. It has been sent to the state's attorney's office to review just to, in case that's the direction that the board would like to go. Um, another thing that we went ahead and did is we did post a COVID-19 enforcement support position, which is part-time. To this point, um, Kathy, has been handling all those complaints and all of the follow-up. And of course, as the director of an entire division, she has a lot of other things going on and the number of complaints has been significant. So we are looking to hire someone that can assist with taking those complaints, following up on them, making those visits. But what we kind of wanted to discuss with the board is just seeing, do you all feel as if you would like us to pursue adopting a mask ordinance that we would enforce over all businesses that we are able to outside of what we have been doing, which is the businesses over which we have jurisdiction that have a permit from us. So that would be a restaurant, um, tanning, tattoo, body art, and just wanted to kind of get a feel for what you're thinking. This is not a vote. This is just a conversation about how the board would like to proceed and what direction you all would like to move at this point. So I'll open it up for discussion with the board. Are currently our uh, tanning salons and oh, I'm not. Yeah, I'm open. I guess um, are tanning salons and places like that under mask ordinance? No. Yes, those facilities are required to wear a mask at this That's point. What I thought. Okay. I was under the impression that all places were, but. Gas stations are a huge, inside gas stations are a huge violation of it. Well, and that's what we're looking at is right now, of course, you know, we follow up on all complaints and provide the education and ask for the compliance if it's not a business over which we have jurisdiction. But now the way that this administrative rule has come through, if we decide to adopt an ordinance which has something like fines in it, then we would be able to, if appropriate, um, give a fine to a place like you know, a gas station, which some of those have food permits. So that's, I might be in a gray area there, but um, to a place that normally we wouldn't have a permit with, but that we would be able to issue a fine and have follow up with that. So that's what we're looking at. Do we want to expand and start going into those different areas and going through a whole fine process? Of course, the board would have to approve the ordinance and approve any kind of fines that we would present. But we just wanted to see, is that the direction the board would like to go? Or do you feel very strongly that, you know, sticking with the businesses that we have permits with is more appropriate? Obviously, we have a responsibility to the community. But as you all have known throughout this as a board member and have seen, I'm sure, in the media, there are some people that are not going to be compliant. Um, there's a lot of legal 
implications with all of this as well that we already have experienced. And, um, you know, as the public health entity, we want to do everything that we can to protect people. But we also want to be reflective of our board's wishes and priorities in this situation. Is the health department the only um, governmental body that could do the ordinance for this or could the city do it or the county do it or, you know, or somebody else do it? So we are not the only entity that can do it. And the city did adopt a mask ordinance. And I'm not sure enforcement wise exactly how that's going. I know they did ask us to partner with them in that and follow up on complaints that they receive. Um, and I think deal with those complaints as they would come in. So basically enforcing their ordinance was my understanding of that. And at that time I told them, you know, we're definitely following up on any complaints that we get, absolutely. But as far as any enforcement, we need to wait to hear back from legal because at that time we hadn't yet. So now we have, and basically legal said, um, it's not something for them to tell us what is appropriate for us to do. But at this point, because of that administrative rule, it's our decision policy-wise and administrative-wise how we want to handle this. So there's not, I know that um, Chief Getz did tell us if, if we needed support in this, that he would be supportive. I don't know exactly what that looks like. Um, we'd have to get into further discussion, but we wanted to speak with you as the board members first. I think at this point, I, I would favor sticking with the businesses that have permits through the health department and not going outside of that. And just to kind of, sorry guys, this is Kathy, just to piggyback a little bit with what uh, Mr. Tibbs just said is that everybody, whether we have jurisdiction or not, um, when we get a complaint, I do a friendly education call because I think that there is so much, conf there is, I shouldn't say so much, but there is still a lot of confusion about do I fall under what guideline and what are my requirements? So we do, I do my best to try and explain how a business fits into that so that they are aware of it. Um, the second complaint, like Brandy said, requires an on-site investigation. Um, Whitney and I went and did seven of those in one day last week just to knock them all out. And of the seven, six of them were founded. Masks were not being worn either at all, improperly, you name it. Um, and keep in mind, by the time it got to the second, I've already given them a call, done the friendly education, reminding them of, you know, you have to wear a mask over your nose, not on your chin, your forehead, any of that stuff. Um, so I do my best to try and, and take care of everything during that first phone call. Um, but even on the second phone call, if it was a business that was outside of my jurisdiction, I, at this point, I would forward it over to local law enforcement simply because of it not being in my jurisdiction. But I will tell you that out of the hundred or so complaints that we've gotten, I'm going to say 90% of them are in our jurisdiction to where they do have food permits that could be pulled. Any other questions or thoughts or anyone have strong opinions one way or the other? I, I do have an opinion on uh, this, is Brett. Um, I, I am really worried about us getting into the more of what some people are gonna call the police state and, and doing that and where that's, I, I I struggle with it. I I really do. Um, I I get both sides of it. Obviously, I've I've worn masks forever, and but if you go certain places, I mean, yeah, they're supposed to do it. But again, you know, the average person again is going to say it's not a law. They don't have to do it. Um, and then now we're trying to get into you know. Um, like I said, it's such a gray area. I have, I struggle with it. I really do. So I just, that's what I'm going to, that's all I'm going to say. So. And again, this is Kathy to, to follow up on what Dr. Druger said of those that we've, we've called or even been out to do the onsite investigation with, um, you know, we've focused on employees. 
um, not necessarily customers, but the employees. And of all of them, I have asked, you know, how are you guys handling customers coming in without a mask? Um, and the general consensus is that their corporate offices have said, you are not the police and you will not be policing this issue. Um, and so they say that they'll put the signs on the door that says, yes, a mask is required, but so many of them will not refuse service because of the policing issue. Um, and I even had one gentleman from Walgreens who we dealt with on a complaint that apparently there was a uh, Walgreens manager in the St. Louis area that when confronted a customer about putting a mask on, the customer ended up stabbing the manager and sent him to the hospital. So there mm. are a lot of really hard um, feelings and a little, a lot of hard decisions to be made. So I, I totally understand where you're coming from too, Dr. Jerker. And, and, you know, the other thing that a lot of public perception is we've jumped, originally when this started, it was six feet or wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. And the problem is right now, we've, honestly, the perception is we've jumped over the six foot thing and that's gone. So if the people are truly away from each other, you don't need the mask. And... Now it's just if you don't see people are saying if you, and now it's all about just the mask and we've that's where that to me that's where that gray area comes into because originally it was six foot or a mask now it's it's all about the optic of having a mask. Uh, I have a question though. So did he? You know, you said you had the like seven you know, where you went on the second time and they still didn't have a mask. Is that usual or is the phone calls effective or do we need that enforcement? You know, how important is it having like the stick at the end of that instead of just the carrots or whatever? Do you think, do we need that enforcement mechanism? To be quite honest, I don't know. And that's so far because I have yet to get a third complaint on any facility. Um, now, I will be, you know, the first to say that there were two facilities last week um, that I actually combined their second and third because I'm getting so far behind with everything. Um, so I thought while we're out doing the on-site investigation, I'm just going to make sure we address everything that's being said. Um, but I have yet to get to that actual third complaint where I would go out and issue a cease and desist. Um, or and or possibly pull a food permit. So I don't know if I can give you an honest answer on that question right now. Does anybody else have any other questions or thoughts about that? Well, I do very much appreciate the thoughts that you have shared um, and the questions that you have asked. If you have any follow-up questions or anything, you can certainly let me know. But I think I have a feel for what direction the board would like to move at this time. So thank you. And that's all I have on that right now, uh, Candy. Thank you, Brandy. Approval of the um, FY 2021 pay, um, pay grade scale. Okay, that's just our uh, base pay grade scale, which reflects the different levels of um, categories of positions here at the health department. And it does show the um, base pay for each position. And I honestly just realized at the very top of the column with the salaries that I didn't change that year. So I apologize for that. But all the other amounts have been updated. So this reflects a 2% increase from the base pay from our current fiscal year, this would become effective 12-1 of 20, and that 2% is for full and part-time. This has sample job titles in it. It shows the education and experience required for each level of positions and then the pay rate. So um, each year we present this to our board and we do it around budget time and just ask you to approve this for us. All right, I need a motion to approve. I, Mary Jane, I approve. Thank you, Jane. Second. Page will second. second. Thank you. Um, roll call vote, please. Candace Clevenger. Approved. Page Toe. Approved. Vivian Goodman. Approved. 
Jan Hack. Approve. Dr. Jerker. Approve. Sue Crows. Approve. Mary Jane Linton. Approve. Dr. Patterson. Approve. Phil Tibbs. Approve. And Laura Zimmerman. Approve. Thank you. Motion passed. Uh, approval of the Macon County Board resolution approving acceptance of donations of goods and materials and the free distribution of the same by the health department. Okay, this resolution is something that um, we did present it to state's attorney's office. They did make some edits and send it back to us, so it has been reviewed by legal. Basically, this resolution is just making sure that things are as um, on point as possible with everything we're doing here at the health department. Um, we became aware that if we're receiving and handing out donations, it's best practice to have a resolution in place for that. And that is something that we do. Um, it depends on what the, the good is, um, of whether we take it or not. Of course, it's always assessed whether or not there would be any risk presented or anything like that. So we just wanted to make sure to have a resolution in place to be following best practices. So that's what this resolution would accomplish. All right, thank you. Um, I need a motion to approve the this is Paige. I'll make a motion. Thank you. Thank it. I second. Maybe in second. Thank you. Roll call vote. Candace Clevenger. Approved. Paige Toad. Approved. Vivian Goodman. Approved. Jan Hack. Jan. Approve. Thank you. Dr. Jerger. Approve. Sue Crows. Approve. Mary Jean Linton. Approve. Dr. Patterson. Approve. Phil P Tibbs. Approve. Laura Zimmerman. Approve. All right, thank you, Mr. Carey. The next item on the um, Agenda discussion regarding HealthWorks Illinois' lead agency and case management programs. Okay, so we do actually have two different HealthWorks Illinois programs. One is housed in our clinical nursing division, and that is a lead agency side of the program, which has historically been funded by DCFS. The other side is our case management program, and that is in our WIC and family case management division here at the health department. A significant change that was presented was that the state was going to discontinue funding us directly as a health department, the case management side through DHS and a lead agency side through DCFS, and they are transitioning uh, to a managed care model where they would fund youth care. And then youth care has reached out to us and other health departments to ask to contract so that we can continue to provide those programs for these high risk children and in both areas, the lead agency and the case management side of things. And so it is very important that we continue these programs. Honestly, the, these are programs that we have been looking at since I've been the administrator and whether and trying to determine whether or not we would continue with these programs. There have been some issues with both um, sides of the program with funding, adequate funding, number of caseload of what we are told that we would have and what we're funded for, and then the actual number of caseload, the ability to obtain reports, the ability to adequately uh, staff the the programs, especially on the lead agency side. So we were assessing that. And now Youth Care has presented to us the option to contract with them to continue the grant through the end of our current uh, fiscal year, which would be that June 30th date. So the lead agency side, they did give us a contract with an actual amount. I will tell you that we asked if we were going to consider taking on this contract, if they would increase the grant because historically it has been underfunded and we have not been able to hire an adequate amount of staff to cover the increasing caseload every single year. And so Youth Care did and increase that from $134,205 to $152,849, which would cover our expenses to be able to hire adequate amount of staffing. 
So we would plan to continue to do this if the board does approve this contract to contract with youth care on the lead agency side. We've been very upfront with youth care that this is a program that we have been evaluating and whether or not it is appropriate for the health department to continue on. However, because youth care does not have a backup plan for these children at this time, we do feel that it would be best to contract with them at least through the end of this current year, um, continue to evaluate, see if things improve with the increase in funding and maybe there will be better you know, communication and reporting to where we feel like it would be more appropriate to continue on with this program. But if not, that we would be able to discontinue and hopefully youth care would have a plan in place. Whereas right now there's no other plan for these children if we do not continue to contract with youth care moving forward. So the lead agency side is the next bullet point on the agenda that we are asking you to approve this contract for us to continue with youth care. The case management side that is housed in Wiccan Family Case Management, we do not have a final contract yet from them to, for you to review. We also do not have a final grant amount from them. I will tell you that we were able to obtain a grant amount finally, maybe about two weeks ago, and that grant amount was about $143,000 less than what our expenses would be, and that was true for other health departments as well that when they got their grant amount. So at that at that dollar level, we would not be able to continue on the case management side because there are one and a half FTEs in that grant and that would not even be able to cover one FTE. So we did inform Youth Care of that and that was a statewide uh, communication that Youth Care received from other health departments as well. At this time, we are still waiting to hear back from Youth Care with a final number. They are looking at our current caseload and seeing if they can increase that. So right now, our health fund is supporting that as the transition was supposed to occur September 1st. Um, however, the original grant from DHS, which was for Health Works and also for high-risk infant follow-up, that award amount has not decreased at this time, and they are going to pay through September. So at this time, we do have some wiggle room while we're waiting to hear back from Youth Care about this funding amount, but I wanted you all to be aware of what was happening, not just with this contract that we're asking you to approve, but also that if there's not adequate funding on the Wiccan family case management side, we do not feel as if we are going to be able to continue with that uh, because we would not be able to pay staff and we would be looking at about $143,000 of tax dollars having to be committed to just one program. So we're reviewing all of that right now. We're still waiting to hear back from youth care on the case management side, but the lead agency side is the contract that we are presenting to you tonight as the next point that we are asking for approval. Any questions about that? That's all I have on that, Candy. All right, thank you. Um, we're to the point of approving the master service agreement for HealthWorks. Um, do I have a motion? So basically, the bottom line, what is this component? Is the other component like with DCFS, a child abuse type thing? Yeah, so these are kids that have put been in foster care placement. The lead agency side, they make contact with the family, the foster care family or parent immediately after, within a certain amount of days after they are placed to ensure that medical appointments are made. And then the case management side is a case manager that actually follows up with that foster parent and provides the case management piece of that. So you are health care and then managing that child's health care and yeah. trying to obtain information from the family or whatever about what has happened in the real regular home. Yes, and also making sure to follow up that the foster parents getting them to there's an initial medical appointment that has to happen within yeah. a certain amount of days. So they ensure that that gets completed. They obtain information. The case manager is a nurse, so she reviews things as well when she's on the case management side. Um, so again, very high risk children. And ultimately, even with all of the problems that we've experienced on the lead agency side with this program, we felt like since DCFS and youth care, there was no backup plan that 
these children could be at even greater risk if we did not continue this program at that point, which is why we felt like that was the most responsible thing to do um, for these children and families. But again, we'll continue to evaluate. And if the program continues the way that it has, then we will certainly be talking about whether or not it is responsible to continue into it next year. And FY, um, I guess it'll be 22 at that point. And I will tell you this contract, I did have legal look at it. And if the board does approve it, then it will also go through the steps all the way through the county board for approval. It is grant funded. Yes. Yes, the, the HealthWorks program historically has been split. The lead agency side is paid through DCFS. And, and manage. And then the case management side has been through DHS and managed through that side. So the programs haven't always, not the programs, but the funders have not always talked to one another. Um, people don't always even have lead agency and case management in the same building. We happen to because we have both of the grants. Um, but that's one, been one of the issues that's been disconnected. Youth care is going to be doing both. So we're hoping that there would be an improvement with that, with the change. But of course, we won't know until we're in it if the contract is approved for us to move forward. Uh, it sounds to me like a good way to coordinate and make certain that the care is being given and finding the details because there have been, we've seen the end result of the drops in the system that we have now. So I would say if we're being funded for it, I would, and we have the staff to do it, I would vote to approve. Well, I will tell you, we did have an employee um, that partially worked on the lead agency side that did resign a little bit earlier this year. Um, but we do need someone that's in one of those higher level um, that we looked at the pay grade scale, a higher level employee, because there are certain minimum qualifications an employee has to have to be able to perform the functions in the lead agency role. So with this increase in funding, we would be able to hire someone to replace the person that left at a higher level that could perform all the necessary duties so that that caseload could be split in a more appropriate way um, to ensure that they are all being managed as thoroughly as possible. So we would have to hire another level eight for this contract, but we now have the funding to be able to do that if we contract with youth care. I make a motion that we accept this. Thank you, a second. This is Jan, second. <clears throat> I'll say this is Jan. Thank you, Jan. Uh, mm -hmm. Roll call, that, please. Candace Clevenger. Approved. Paige Tote. Approved. Vivian Goodman. Approved. Vivian. I'm sorry. I was. <laughs> Jan Hack. Approved. Dr. Jerger. Approved. Sue Crows. Approved. Mary Jane Linton. Approved. Dr. Patterson. Approved. Phil Tibbs. Approved. And Laura Zimmerman. Approved. Okay, motion passed. Thank you. Now we have the um, approval of the Macon County Board Resolution for increasing the appropriations of the FY20 Health fund budget for COVID-19 crisis grant. And Sheree is going to cover this one. Yep, I'll take this one. Okay, so this is the COVID-19 crisis grant with the Illinois Department of Public Health. Um, this funding can be used to build capacity for incident management, which includes coordination with public and private partners to, in, to address incident command structure needs and the payment of overtime for necessary employment shifts. Allowable costs include overtime for individuals directly associated with the COVID-19 crisis, public health expenses related to surveillance, epidemiology, laboratory capacity, infection control, mitigation, communication, and other preparedness and response activities associated with COVID-19. 
The total amount is $72,319. Um, this grant began March 16th, 2020, and it ends March 15th, 2021. <coughs> then on the attached document, um, I have detailed out how the expenses will be split to various accounts. Are there any questions? And this just represents the portion that goes for this year. No, this isn't the contact tracing grant. Okay. This is a totally different one. We have um, three grants um, associated with COVID-19. So this is one we received early on and we just didn't get around to discussing it until now. Is that what we spent all this year? Yes. And we've already received a check for the full amount, so. All right. Um, motion to approve. Laura, so moved. Thank you. Second. Janet, second. Thank you. Um, roll call vote. Candace Levenger. Approved. Paige Toad. Approved. Vivian Goodman. Approved. Jan Hack. Approved. Dr. Jerker. Approved. Sue Crows. Approved. Mary Jane Linton. Approved. Dr. Patterson. Approved. Phil Tibbs. Approved. And Laura Zimmerman. Approved. Thank you, motion passed. Next we have the um, um, local cure program uh, for resolution for increased appropriation. Okay, so this is one that we were notified about more recently, and this is the local coronavirus urgent remediation emergency support program, or called local cure. It is funded from the CARES Act and through the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. Um, it is a reimbursement program available to governmental entities, and we were part of allotment B of the program, which was just for certified local public health departments. We are able to submit reimbursement requests for necessary expenditures incurred during the COVID-19 public health emergency for up to $251,469. Um, these costs must not already be accounted for in an approved budget, and the costs must, must be incurred between March 1st and December 30th, 2020. The five categories of eligible expenses are medical expenses, public health expenses, payroll expenses, expenses for actions taken to facilitate with compliance with COVID-19 related public health measures, and any other COVID-19 related expenses reasonably necessary to the function of government. Um, so like I said, it's up to 251,469,000. ,000. I did go ahead and put all of that in the FY20 budget. Um, I'm assuming we will request reimbursement for the full amount, but I mean, we may, we may not. They have asked that, um, we notify them in November if we don't anticipate spending the full amount so they can look at all the health departments in allotment B and reallocate funding to those in need if necessary. So if for some reason we actually needed more money, there may be the possibility of that even happening. You all have the extra expenses that you're gonna be um, spending the money? Well, right now, um, I feel like we I anticipate spending most of it on staffing needs. Um, there are there were a few expenses that we were wanting to put in the contact tracing grant that didn't specifically apply enough to contact tracing to qualify. So we thought that we might be able to use some of that fund some of this funding for those items. I mean, um, when we submit everything, we are required to submit an explanation as well, and um, it's going to go through a pretty thorough approval process, it seems like. Um, is there a motion to approve? A 
I'll move to approve. Thank this you. is Paige, I second. Thank you, Paige. I will call that, please. Candace Lovinger. Approved. Paige Toth. Approved. Vivian Goodman. Approved. Jan Hack. Approved. Dr. Jerker. Approved. Sue Crows. Approved. Mary Jane Linton. Mary Jane. This is Brandy. I just saw that she messaged and said she had to leave for a work call. So she's okay. off right now. All right. Thank you. Dr. Patterson. Approved. Phil Tips. Approved. And Laura Zimmerman. Approved. All right, motion carried. Um, next is the FY 2019 audit. Okay, I just wanted to briefly go over the FY19 um, audit and share um, how our bottom line came out for the year and any findings related to the health department in the countywide audit report. So um, this is for the period of December 1st, 2018 through November 30th, 2019. The net fund net change in fund balance was positive $233,951. So this brought our fund balance at the end of November 2019 to 4,323,000. Then um, looking at the management letter, the only thing they noted specifically about the health department was in reference to a finding that we had with the um, Department of Human Services Fiscal Administrative Review. So the funding, the finding from DHS said that MCHD management should require all direct wages be documented with time and effort reporting or some other documented quantifiable distribution method, methodology. Direct payroll allocation should be according to these reports and not based on approved budgets or time studies. So this is referencing to how our staff track or do not track their time spent on specific grants. Um, our policy and procedure has been to do a time study um, during the year for a two week period and then take a look at the time spent on grants and adjust salary percentages going to those programs um, to match that. However, they have said that a two week time period is not an accurate representation of all the time. So they want us to be documenting this every day, basically. So um, we looked into ways to do this with our current time clock tracking system and um, it was going to be possible. However, it was going to um, create a significant amount of training necessary to our staff and us coming up with some workarounds within the system. So obviously this is a very bad time to have to figure that out and have to train all of our staff again. So luckily we were presented with the next item on the agenda. Um, I'm just gonna move into talking about that since they kind of flow together. It's the new accounting system for the county. So a couple months ago, the auditor's office was informed that our accounting software provider would not be providing support for the payroll application after July 2021. So their recommendation was to outsource payroll and um, Carol Reed, the county auditor, she estimated that this would cost 40 to $50,000. So the staff in the auditor's office began researching um, some other software and I was able to sit, on sit in on several um, virtual demonstrations with them. And just last week or the week before, um, the county board did approve going with new software and it's called MIP Fund Accounting. We sat in on several demonstrations. Um, I sat in on several. Brandy, Bethany, Evan, our IT, and Kimberly, who does payroll, um, also sat, on, sat in on a couple. 
We're very excited about this software. I'm excited as you can be for accounting software guests. I'm pretty pumped, but <laughs> um, we're very excited about it. Um, right now with our software, we use a VPN connection and connect to a remote computer, computer at the auditor's office. So it's really kind of a hassle. Um, only one employee at the health department can be in the accounting software at a time. So as you can imagine, that can create some issues with deadlines and everything. So the new software will be on the cloud. So we'll simply just be able to open, open it up anytime we want without any issues. Um, this system also includes an application called Employee Web Services. So this is going to be our solution for the finding. With this application, employees will be able to um, track their time so they can clock in and out just as they currently are used to doing every day. But in addition, at the end of the day, they will be able to select how many hours they've spent working on each program. So every day they'll have a daily total saying I had five hours for the WIC program and two hours for family case management. Then they will submit their time to their manager, the manager will approve it, and then the system will just magically calculate the percentage that should be charged to each grant for their salary and flow directly into payroll. So this will give us our accurate reporting of staff time on the various grants. Um, I have, back to the finding, I did go ahead and submit a draft policy for this change to them. They did approve the draft. They've just asked for an update once we get the system up and running. Um, they're very understanding with the pandemic going on right now, but also I made sure that they were aware that we did acknowledge the importance of making sure we were tracking time correctly and it would definitely be a priority as soon as the system was up and running. So um, within the system, employees can also request time off, submit address changes, they can print their pay stubs. There really are a lot of features within us within it that we're all pretty excited about and should end up saving a lot of staff time. Um, let's see, Carol Reed has submitted the signed contract to them and the vendor is working to get us scheduled for virtual training right away. As far as I have heard, the goal for a go live date um, is the beginning of our fiscal year, December 1st. This would be for everything except payroll, and they're hoping payroll can go live January 1st, so all figures to process W-2s will be within the same systems. I think that's all I have on those two topics. If there are any questions, I can try to answer them. Any questions for Sheree? All right, moving to the last item, approval of the 2021 proposed budget. All right. We did just go over this in the finance meeting. So um, I sent out the budget to everyone this weekend, Saturday afternoon, I think. So hopefully you all received that and were able to take a look. Um, we're just going to start by going through the little summary documentation we put together and then if there are more specific questions or if you want to dig into more details, I'm open to that also. So this budget ended up with a total revenue of 7530000 total expense 7466000 which gave us a bottom line of $64,691. This is fairly comparable to FY20, and we had budgeted for a bottom line of $70,621. Um, overhead expenditures, we're always looking at our overhead expenses and seeing where we can make cuts. Um, we have had some expense increase in IT expenses over the last few years as we purchased more computers, but we've also had reductions in other areas, so we've been able to keep our overhead costs pretty much the same. Last year it was 17% and this year it's actually 16%. So now Brandy is going to talk about staffing. All right, so this budget does include an increase in payroll that will be given through performance evaluations. So those will be merit-based and those are completed in the fall every year. In 2014, 
there was a survey that was completed on salaries here at the health department of comparable health departments. It revealed that health, our health department salaries were up to 25% lower than positions at other health departments. So back then they used these results to develop and implement a plan to increase the salaries here to be as comparable as possible so that we are paying competitively and able to recruit and maintain staff. In 2018, when going over our budget and then providing an update on this uh, development, members of EEHW through the county board encouraged the health department to continue to address this issue as we were still definitely behind other entities and other comparable health departments. The health department has made significant adjustments to current employee salaries and even base pay levels for incoming employees. At this time, our salaries are definitely a lot more comparable than they were back in 2014, but are still somewhat lower than other comparable health departments. And in comparison to other sectors, health department salaries are still significantly lower, and this does cause us issues a lot of times with recruiting and maintaining staff. This is especially true when it comes to our registered nurse positions, which of course are critical to the effective functioning of our health department, even before we were in a pandemic and especially true even more now. These positions are very difficult to fill, not only because of a national nursing shortage, but also because our nurses are paid lower than comparable um, health departments and of course local, other local healthcare facilities. We also have some pending retirements and we have to plan ahead to ensure that we adequately fill these positions, not only with number of staff, but with qualified experienced professionals. Another staffing consideration for this in upcoming years is the increase in minimum wage. We've definitely, I believe, been very on top of planning for this, not only ensuring we are compliant, but also trying to plan ahead for the fact that as these um, positions are increasing that are lower on that pay grade scale, that there could be resulting pay compression as the years go by with some of those higher level professional positions. So we are looking at ways to ensure that there is an appropriate balance between those positions and the incoming salaries. And of course, keeping in mind our current staff as well. We are also actively prioritizing succession planning. We've done a lot of that, I think, since um, even when I was in human resources and, and Diana was here, and we continue that now, ensuring that we are cross-training staff as much as possible. So if someone does leave or if there is an emergency, if someone um, has to retire or go to a different position, if someone is unexpectedly out of the office, that we are able to have someone that can step into that role and cover as much as possible especially during the time of a pandemic. We've even restructured some parts of our organization to be as effective and as efficient as possible. There has been a need we have determined to grow administration in our health department, and that's going to include that accounting assistant we have talked about over the last few months, and also an IT support specialist assistant. We do have one, someone starting in the accounting position next week. We are still looking for someone for the IT position. Um, right now, we do have one person in the building fulfilling each of those functions with someone that is partially cross-trained to cover the majority of those duties. And then when it comes to IT, we do have a contractor you know, on call that if we do have to, in an emergency, contact someone that we can do that. However, those are not long-term sustainable solutions to these problems. And also the problem is growing as we are growing our number of staff and as we are becoming an even more progressive organization when it comes to things like our IT needs. Thankfully, we've had really committed staff in these positions that have done whatever it takes any day of the week or any hour of the day to ensure that that gets done, but we really need a better plan. So that's why we've developed those positions. And then also, as we've talked to you about, we have done some restructuring in our nursing division. We have added a clinic coordinator position down there and that person um, has started this week. So that's a temporary position that was part of the COVID-19 grant. However, if we find that that works and that it works well and that we continue to need that, then we are planning for the possibility of that position becoming permanent. As we have also spoken with you about, it's been our priority of this organization to address and prioritize health equity, inclusion, and diversity. So as part of the COVID-19 grant, we are hiring a coordinator that will focus on health equity, diversity, and inclusion for the entire building. And following the conclusion of this grant, we are going to maintain that as a full-time position uh, because that is something public health should always be focusing on. All right, I'll hand it back to Sheree for the grant section. Okay, for state fiscal year 2021, we were fortunate to receive level funding for most of our grants. Um, we received an increase in funding of $26,640 for family case management and an increase of $12,960 for our high-risk high infant follow-up HealthWorks Illinois grants. 
assigned caseloads for these programs remain the same. For the breastfeeding peer counselor grant, we, we received an increase of 16,000. This was due to an overall increase of federal funding um, for the program overall. And then for our teen pregnancy prevention program, we received a decrease of $2,602. The WIC program received a caseload decrease from 2,083 clients to 2,052 clients resulting in a decrease in funding of $3,431. Um, also in FY20, we talked to you about bringing back the car seat program. We have dollars set aside in a restricted fund balance from previous fiscal years to purchase car seats. And um, then last year, we also received a grant from IDOT we currently have nine trained car seat technicians, but unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have had to put the car seat program on hold. Grant funding was used to purchase car seats, and we hope that we will be able to get back to holding safe car seat check events as soon as possible. Okay, Brandy. All right, so this next section just discusses a couple of significant changes with the HealthWorks Illinois grants through uh, the lead agency side and the case management side. We did already go over that earlier in the meeting. So of course, if you have questions, I can answer those. Uh, but basically, as we discussed, there would be a significant change with whom we would be contracting with. And then also that increase in funding that I discussed on the lead agency side, where they did agree to increase the grant award from $134,205 up to $152,849 to ensure that they were paying us appropriately for the number on our actual caseload and to ensure that we actually could have enough staff to fully and thoroughly serve those clients and the families. And then also getting into more COVID-19 specific grants, we've talked a little bit about those as well. Um, as the health department, we always know that we're emergency responders. And of course, we always plan and train for natural or man-made disasters such as a pandemic. Um, while we tra train for this and we prepare for this as much as possible, the magnitude of COVID-19 has been extremely significant, as we all know. Um, regularly, health departments are underfunded and there's a lot of struggle with maintaining staff or recruiting staff across the board, not just here in Mason County. So, you know, we've been monitoring the situation um, around COVID-19 before there was ever a confirmed case here. And so there was a lot of staff time that went into that. Early on in this response, there was no word on whether or not we'd receive any kind of funding to support that. So um, we were very grateful when we did hear that there was going to be some additional funding, which included the COVID crisis grant that we talked about earlier for the $72,319. The local cure reimbursement program with funding up to $251,469. And of course, of course, the COVID contact tracing grant that we've talked about that was for $2,861,712. It was critical for us to be able to receive this funding, to be able to grow the number of staff that we have. Our team did an excellent job of doing everything that they could to work day, night, weekend, holiday, and they've all been doing that since March and we're extremely grateful for that, but we needed, of course, a long-term plan. So we were extremely grateful to find out that there was some funding that would back that up. Of course, it is temporary, so it's not a long-term solution to the fact that health departments are underfunded, but I do think across the state and probably across the nation, this is bringing up a lot of conversation for adequately funding public health. So maybe there'll be some movement on that moving forward. Um, so again, we filled a lot of those positions, but they are still many open and we are trying to get those filled, but that has definitely been something that has assisted us in this time. Okay, now for the information technology upgrades. In FY20, we successfully migrated all of our employee accounts to Office 365. When the COVID-19 stay-at-home orders were issued, a large majority of MCHD employees were able to seamlessly transfer to a work-from-home environment. This allowed us to continue to serve and provide critical services to our clients. When presenting this project during last year's budget process, it was predicted that 365 could be beneficial during an emergency event. Microsoft 365 has proven to be an asset to our team, and um, especially during this global emergency that we're experiencing. With Office 365, all employees have access to their files anywhere internet is available. 
Mobile work and collaboration are much simpler. Instant messaging, sharing documents with team members, video chats, and an internal social network are just the start of the features that are available to us. Um, this also means that all of our information is being stored in the cloud, which allows for minimal downtime in the case of a catastrophic event at, at the health department. In addition to improving efficiency and productivity, Office 365 provided stability during this pandemic for not only our internal employees, but also for our community partners and members of the public. Our staff use 365 for regular functions every day, but we've also leveraged this technology to hold virtual meetings with stakeholders through COVID, throughout COVID-19. Um, it's also provided us a platform to use to safely and effectively hold these Board of Health meetings and stream them online for the public. A computer refresh began in FY19 and carried into FY20. New computers were purchased for all employees. The computers re we replaced ranged from five to eight years in age. Um, now we are hoping we are able to get back on a better schedule to spread out these purchases throughout various fiscal years. Plans for FY21 include Manage Engine Desktop Central. This provides remote monitoring, management, and control. Remote monitoring and management allow for centralized installation and uninstallation of software. Um, our IT will be able to assist staff members without having to be in the same room or coming in contact with any other employees equipment. Another part of this is the Service Desk Plus. This provides online help desk and asset management and purchase management. We will be able to track all IT assets from pre-purchase all the way to decommissioning those assets. We also have budgeted for a redundant internet connection. We are seeing an increase in the use of cloud services, such as Microsoft 365 and business critical state of Illinois applications, moving to web-based services. Pretty much all of our divisions have, all of our divisions have some application that they are using that are completely web-based. Um, because of this move to internet-based communications, redundant internet is essential. All of our COVID-19 contact tracing and case investigation is done via web-based services. So right now with only a single internet connection from a single provider, we also have a single point of failure. A service provider outage could bring all of our services to a halt and having a second connection through a second provider would give us the resilience needed to continue operations during this critical time. All right, and last but not least, we'll give you a summary on the health fund balance. So as of August 31st, 2020, the health fund balance was at $4.9 million. The FY21 budget shows the health department averaging $622,192 in expenses per month. This indicates that an appropriate working operational fund balance should average between $1.8 and $2.5 million annually. Fluctuation naturally occurs due to property tax payment schedule. This current global pandemic has certainly been a fine example of why it's important for us to have a healthy fund balance. For many years, I know we've talked about this to the board when we presented the budget and talking about ensuring that we do maintain a healthy fund balance because of the fact that something like a TB outbreak could occur. And that has certainly proven true with the pandemic. Like I mentioned very early on in the response, there was no word about us receiving any funding. So we knew that anything that we would have to do, whether that was hiring additional staff to be contact tracers or vaccination nurses or whatever it ended up being, that we did have some money sitting there that we would be able to use for that need if we didn't get any other funding from the state um, or federal. So we are very happy to hear that we did, but again, it has definitely shown why it's important to ensure that we do maintain that healthy fund balance moving forward. A plan for some of the health fund balance dollars in FY20. If you were with us uh, last year when we talked about the budget, you will probably remember this. One was the implementation of electronic health records. So prior to the local COVID-19 pandemic response, we certainly did quite a bit of research and speaking with other health departments. We were getting ready to schedule visits to, to other health departments to be able to lay eyes on what they do and look at their processes to see what would fit our needs best. Um, and the same goes for our digital environmental health system that we would like to implement as well. 
Those things, of course, have been sidelined because of our COVID-19 pandemic. Certainly nursing and environmental health have been two of the busiest, and this is not to understate what anybody else has done, but two of the busiest divisions in having to respond. So those things have certainly been sidelined for the time being. Also in clinical nursing, as we've mentioned to you, there is a statewide implementation of a brand new contact tracing program, which is web-based. So our nursing team and all of our new staff that are coming on are already in the process of learning a brand new program that they have to use on a daily basis to complete these contact tracing processes. So for right now, those two projects have been sidelined, but they are absolutely still a priority to us. And we hope that we will be able to implement those as soon as COVID-19 is not as burdensome. And as soon as we are able to have, whether that's visits or maybe even a Teams meeting with screen share where we can be more hands-on and seeing uh, some demos about how both of those programs would work. Another major project we discussed last year with our health fund balance was the expansion of the dental clinic. And we did receive funds to do that. As you all know, we have even a, a applied for additional funds for that. We've not forgotten about it. Because of the high risk nature of transmission in a dental setting, we did close the den dental clinic for a little bit early on in the COVID-19 response. The clinic is open now. They've done some physical structure changes and some process structure changes. So they're taking every precaution that they can. Uh, at this time, it is not ideal to expand, but we have been in communication with our grant funder to ensure that the, that money is still there and that we will still be able to use it at the time that we would be able to actually start construction which is what we are about to do right before we started dealing with COVID so heavily here in Macon County. Our leadership team is always looking for ways to recruit and maintain the strongest team of staff here possible with minimum wage increasing and the higher salaries at other places of employment. It becomes more and more difficult as we've talked about to fill some of these positions. So we're looking at ways to address those needs, whether that's adjustments in some of the salaries, um, whether we have to do something additional to recruit registered nurses, which is one of the most difficult positions to recruit here at the health department. So we're looking at all of those things and we may have to use health fund dollars for those. Also, the significant staffing changes that I discussed earlier when it came to administration and uh, clinical nursing and then that position created for health equity, diversity and inclusion. We will be using health fund dollars for those as well. That would be what would support that. And we feel that that's a very appropriate, effective and responsible way to use those dollars to achieve long term sustainability and success here at the health department and then in our entire community. And then of course, as always, it's always a priority of the health department to find ways to grow the awareness about what we do. So that may be a way that we would use health fund dollars in the upcoming year as well. So that's what we have for the summary. I want to say thank you to all of you Board of Health members. I know this has been a very long discussion with the budget and everything else. So thank you for your time. And then a big thank you to the staff and our team that's put in all the time to bring all of this together. So thank you to all of you. And that is all I have. Uh, Sheree, if you want to add anything, if not, we would be able to move into questions. Yeah, um, basically this document we just went over summarizes all the major changes in the budget for this year. So um, we can answer any questions you have or if you want to dig into numbers, I'm open to whatever. <laughs> I can show you some really cool Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> And I know Sheree did mention at the beginning, you know, we did meet with the finance committee at five o'clock and they did review this and approve it. Just so you know, we did fulfill that step as well. Thank you. Know, we, we will be presenting to the county finance com committee next week. Are there any questions for staff? Do I have an approval a uh, motion to approve? Phil moved to approve. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Vivian. Um, roll call and vote, please. Candace Clevenger. Approved. Paige Toth. Approved. Vivian Goodman. Approved. Jan Hack. Approved. Dr. Jerger. Approved. Sue Crows. Approved. Mary Jane Linton. Approve. Had to find my unmute. <laughs> Dr. Patterson. Approve. Phil Tibbs. Approve. And Laura Zimmerman. Approve. Well, thank you. Motion passed. Is there anything else to come before the board? Nope. I have a motion to adjourn. Laura, so moved. 
I so move. Thank you. Roll call vote. <laughs> Candace Clevenger. Approved. 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 Vivian Goodman. Yes. Jan Hag. Approved. Dr. Jerger. Yes. Sue Crows. Approved. Mary Jane Linton. Approved. Dr. Patterson. Approved. Bill Tibbs. Approved. And Laura Zimmerman. Approved. Uh, motion passed adjournment. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all so Thank much. You.